I'll come back to the reason for that, but I just thought it was a lovely picture to open up on. So I'm going to really speak about competence um, with a particular focus on training and how to make sure it's effective. I think as Clive said, it's important um, to make sure that training is effective. Um, we're going to look at sort of various types of training that are delivered later on. And for people to be competent, for them to be able, to be skilled, proficient, and appropriate to their role. So we're not going to expect everyone to be able to do everything, but whatever your role is, to be able to do what you need to do to fulfil your role. Roles and responsibilities have widened, and they're saying about looking at skill mix, how to use people in the workforce effectively, so that the patient's experience is the best. Um, even in my career, and I'm sure a number of people in here, the roles of HCAs, of nurses, of doctors have changed, and we're doing tasks that before would have been done by somebody at a higher level. But it's not just roles and responsibilities that have changed. Patients have changed, healthcare needs have changed. Um, we've got a population that are living a lot longer. And people that are living with conditions that 10, 20, 30 years ago, they would not have survived. And they're surviving um, by the use of technology, machinery that's keeping them alive, um, inventions that are keeping them alive. Um, I've actually got a friend who has uh, TPN. So she's being fed via a, a central line. And she's survived now for 12 years. Now, 12 years ago, when she had most of her bowel removed, she wasn't expected to live more than two weeks. And she's still alive. So, um, and you know, we've got children in the community on ventilators. And we've got adults in the community as well. We've got people with dementia that, because of uh, types of care, are able to live longer and sort of being kept safe. So people that work with these patients need to understand the technology, the medication, the type of complex care required. And then in London particularly, but I think you know nationwide, We've got a multicultural society now, and culture also impacts on how people need to be cared for. So there's some things you can and can't do with regards to someone's care because it's not appropriate. Um, and you know, looking at the, the gender of the staff who are there, but how you talk to someone, how you approach them, um, and what would be acceptable. Okay, so having a vision around how people can be competent. Um, what sort of things do we need to consider? Well, we need to look at lessons learned. And there's been a number of reports um, where we can look at the lessons learned from that and think, okay, how does this impact upon competence? What do we need to do? Um, one area I'm particularly interested in um, that came up in the Francis report was about the quality and inconsistencies of training. And this is something I've seen sort of in the organisations that I've worked in, and I'm sure a number of you have also seen as well. The employers have got great expectations, but they're also seeing being sort of put pressure on from other areas as well. The government, the initiatives that the government come up with and the employers have to respond to that. Um, and sometimes the response has to be quite quick. Okay, you know, you've got to make everybody competent in this. Okay, what's the quickest way to do it? Um, the staff, staff who are resisting change where there's uh, lots of changes going on with mergers and closures and things like that. But again, you're still trying to sort of plod on and get people competent and get people trained. What do the public expect? And can we have people competent to that expectation? And then students. Maggie mentioned about you know students and their experience. So what about their competence as well? And what are we doing about universities, 
if we feel they're not actually having people ready to be competent? Are we actually addressing that issue as well? One of the biggest things is the learner needs. Really, really diverse. So you, you can't just have a one-stop shop for training in competence. Okay, back to the burger. McDonaldization, some of you may have already have heard of this. Um, it's the McDonald's approach to meeting standards, whether that's um, stand, like food standards, standards of training. Uh, I remember when the organisation I'm in, and we had to look at a new type of induction. And it was actually decided it was going to be a McDonald's type of induction. So everyone would get the trust induction. It would be exactly the same. You all went through, and this is how it was delivered. Everyone delivered in the same way. Um, some of the speakers were actually given a presentation by their um, managers and said, this is the presentation you will do. So regardless of if you're on several different sites and it's different speakers, you will give this presentation. So uh, no allowance for sort of individuality or the audience you had. Um, now, there can be positives to this type of approach is that you will get the same standard, which you'd assume would be a high standard, wherever you go. So whether you were on this site, and I think um, Siobhan was saying she's got 50 different sites. So that would be a good approach. So whichever site you're on, you would get the same standard. Um, with learners, you have to sort of think wider than that and for it to be effective. And I'm absolutely passionate about it, training being effective. Otherwise, you're just wasting your time. You're just sort of talking um, and people might be listening but they're not going to retain that information. So management by external um, objectives. So processes and procedures prioritised over outcomes and objectives. Um, if I can give you an example of that, um, protected meal times. I'm sure some of you got protected meal times. Um, one of the things I heard during protective meal times was that uh, a patient asked to go to the toilet and they were told by the student nurse, I'm sorry, it's protective meal times, we're doing lunches. You'll have to wait. Um, targets and indicators, prioritise over values and professional standards. Um, I'm sure some of you know about moving patients around to avoid fines. So going from A&E to an observation ward, for example. Um, moving a patient with dementia because you're going to be fined for having a female and a male in the same bay. Um, compliance and completion prioritised over an, an analysis, I can't speak this morning, and reflection. Mandatory training is a really good example of that. You know, get them through, tick them off. And they're on that report that we can give to um, NHSLA or CQC. But that's fine, they attended. They might have been asleep at the back or texting, but they attended. Another approach, and by the way, I'm not saying this is wrong. Sheep dipping, um, some examples of that. <laughs> Hand hygiene, go through, hands under the light box, off you go, well done. Okay, medical devices, having a circuit, all the different devices in the room, you go around the room, yes you can use it, yes you can use it, yes you can use it. Okay, they're competent and everything, off you go. Okay, ANTT, come and do ANTT here, go to the next station, go and do it there. Yes, you're fine with ANTT. Okay, they have their place and there could be some effectiveness in it and it provides reassurance that people have been trained on these things. But it's not as simple as that. We need to consider the needs of learners. Learners have diverse needs and expectations and somebody mentioned that earlier. Um, and is it an employer-led or a learner-led? So is it employer-led because it needs to tick a box? Or is it learner-led because it's a need for their development? That's really important as to whether someone will retain the information. Um, I'm sure everyone knows about mature learners. Well, they know it all. They've been doing it 30 years. The fact that it's changed several times since they learned how to do it. 
you know, they know it all already, and so you're up against a bit of a resistance there. So we need to sort of find other ways to reach goals. It's not necessarily, you know, you go to that training and that's it. So I think you've got the gist. It's not a tick box exercise. And we need to think what's next. Um, the reason I put this up, I actually live near here. And I, it's just my favourite picture ever. I've got it on calendars and all sorts of things. Um, and I think what I want to say from this... This isn't a simple solution to competence, even though that is, well, I think it's a simple solution. It's not very complex. That's outside the Whittington, if anyone wants to go and have a look. It does exist. Um, the, it's done in black electrical tape, those bits there. It's great, isn't it? I love it. OK, so for competence, I think we need to look at a range of options. Um, technology. Technology can be used for so many things, and I'm not just talking about sort of IT technology, um, but things like simulation, um, being creative about what sort of props you use and things like that for training. E-learning, I think, is great. Um, the, what Maggie was referring to, uh, we actually got involved in the pilot of the system and found that to be very effective to get people to sort of refresh themselves. Um, there's other types of e-learning as well. There's a, there's a wealth of e-learning out there. Um, the workplace is a great classroom. So actually being in the workplace and using real events and learning as you're going along. Um, when people talked about role models, workplace mentors need to be behaving as a role model at all times and people will learn a lot from that um, and I know I've had my own role models and even today where I might look at um, it could be a director of nursing and think okay that's how I need to deal with that sort of complaint in the future because maybe the way I dealt with it wasn't as I would have liked it to have come out. Um, subliminal learning now that's what I've been doing to you with all these pictures um, I'm a great one for sort of saturating people's brains. So it's not just about, you know, coming in the classroom and doing something, but having your screensavers on the computer reminding you about hand hygiene, um, reminding you about attending training, um, having pictures as you come into a classroom, if you're going to have face-to-face, -face, that actually make you start thinking about it before you even come in and sit down. Um, and so the use of sort of visual prompts, visual reminders, um, a, even in a, you know, in a, a clinical room where you've got equipment that you're going to do a procedure, something on the cupboard there, don't forget to do this when you're doing this procedure. You know, if you're going to do a catheterization, don't forget this. Um, so lots of reminders everywhere. We can, I put this on, um, we need to keep the message clear. Um, with regards to competence, uh, not be using loads of complex words and things like that. Going back to Siobhan again, um, using real experience in training, and I think if you've got a patient that's willing to take part in this and actually say, this is what it was like when it was done wrong, and so this is why you need to do it right next time. Um, and I think... <laughs> What's important here is about why were things done in a certain way, not just what was done. So, okay, if it was done wrong, but why? What was all the root cause behind that? Um, and what can we actually do? And then look at, you know, sometimes it's not just the person, but there's actually sort of systemic issues where there aren't the resources or there isn't the time, they're too short staff. It's not just about the person that made that mistake. What made them make a mistake? Um, and looking at the sort of wi wider context of the practice knowledge. And I, I particularly like that from George Santayana about those who fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. So we need to learn from things. So I've got no magic wand about a perfect competence training solution. And I think people need to take it back to their organisations and think about their type of organisation, their staff, their population, what sort of things work. 
getting a, you know, a small working party together and looking what resources have we got in-house, have we got funding, what universities to be used, what can they do. Um, looking at your short-term improvements around competency. So are the documents clear? Are they plain to understand? Can we do some simple guidelines for people? And then also in the long term, looking at who are you actually recruiting? Are those people able or have they got the ability to be able in the future? So I think that's basically me. We're just going back to that. And that is the end. Did I do it in time? I didn't even check the time. <laughs> Good. Thank you.